This is CBC Here and Now. Parts of the province are going to see some significant snow tonight, so you might want to go find those snow shovels. The Corner Brook Christmas Parade is a go, but it's going to look a whole lot different this year. We're going to do our best to make it as, as beautiful as possible. The parade is not going to pass you. You're going to go by the parade. I'll tell you about the reverse parade. Good morning, girls. <laughs> Season tickets are now on sale at Marble Mountain, but the hill will look a little different this year. I chatted with the Minister of Tourism about what changes people can expect. This is a COVID year, so it's not going to be just like it was in the previous years. That story coming up on Here and Now. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. We return to a story we first brought you last night. Police in Bay Roberts have charged a 44-year-old Brigus man with sexually assaulting a resident at a retirement home in Bay Roberts. Tonight, there are questions around how that man, who has previous sexual assault convictions, was able to falsify records and pose as a nurse. Here and Now's Heather Gillis has more. On August 16th, it was alleged that Christopher John Power sexually assaulted a resident over the age of 65 at the Bay Roberts Retirement Center. Police say they investigated and discovered falsified and forged documents at the home. They allege Power, a personal care attendant, was presenting himself as a qualified licensed practical nurse. Power was arrested that day. Formal charges were laid last week. Um, having Mr. Power taken into custody and process released on uh, conditions uh, designed to protect the public, we knew that public safety was addressed. Uh, so then we moved on to the integrity of the investigation and the time that it would take to secure the proper evidence to or lay the charges that you see before Mr. Power right now. Meanwhile, records from provincial court also show Power has previous sexual assault convictions. In 1998, he was convicted of three counts of sexual assault. He was sentenced to six months in jail, probation, and was banned from owning a gun for 10 years. Police say the retirement center cooperated with the investigation, but Gordon Kirby with the Bay Roberts Retirement Center declined comment today, as well as requests for an interview, saying the matter is before the courts. The organization that regulates LPNs also can't say much, for the same reason. In an email, the registrar Wanda Wadman says she isn't aware of another case of someone pretending to be an LPN. She says anyone currently licensed to practice is on the college's register and that potential employers would be well advised to check the Find a Nurse section of their website. A search from that site shows Christopher Power's name can't be found. Meanwhile, the health minister says the home is monitored by Eastern Health, but questions about whether employees have undergone criminal record checks should be directed to the home. No, I mean, this is an awful situation. I mean, from our point of view, this is in the hands of the criminal justice system. This is illegal activity. Meanwhile, Christopher Power of Brigas is expected in a Harbour Grace courtroom later this month on November 18th. Heather Gillis, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the seniors advocate says people who want to work in seniors care should be better vetted. The advocate can't comment directly on the alleged sexual assault in Bay Roberts, but she does say the scrutiny of people entering the industry needs to be enhanced because there's a level of public trust that shouldn't be undermined. People go to live in a uh, long-term care facility or any kind of a, an assisted living or a personal care home situation, or they have people come into their own homes in terms of home support workers because they need support and help. That's the whole reason why. And they themselves and their families and friends have a firm belief that these people are vetted, that these people are in fact um, going to provide their loved one with a safe environment. Well, COVID is further complicating the complexities of care homes and elevating the stress inside. You can hear more about that in my full interview with the Seniors Advocate in about 15 minutes. <laughs>
Much different story today as far as winds go and as far as those temperatures. Take a look at the daytime highs. 9 degrees in St. John's, 4 in Cornerbrook, and then those temperatures up through Labrador into the single digits as well. Happy Valley Goose Bay hovering around the zero degree mark for most of the day. So uh, with those cooler temperatures, especially on the west coast, we're starting to see those snow squalls develop. You can see in that onshore flow a little bit of uh, shower activity happening for the Avalon. That should clear as we head through the overnight tonight. Night. And then in behind this where we're seeing some snow through parts of uh, Halifax and then further east along Nova Scotia, that area of low pressure is going to head our way as we head through the night tonight, already prompting some snowfall warnings from the Canagra Peninsula, Bonavista, all the, or uh, Buren Peninsula, all the way up through to Bonavista and Bonavista North. And it's going to bring some significant snowfall with that as, as well as some wind. I will have all those details coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, what would you do with hundreds of dollars in extra income every month? The province wants to find out. It's examining the possibility of a universal basic income. Malone Mullen explains. It sounds like fiction. A thousand, maybe two thousand dollars dropped into your bank account each month for no reason. It's called a basic income. One model goes like this. The government gives everyone a set amount of money each month. The money comes with no conditions and no strings attached. Those who make more than the threshold come tax time simply pay some or all of it back, plus the usual taxes. The pandemic has shown the immense gaps in our society when it comes to income. Last week, the NDP proposed taking a hard look at making basic income a reality in Newfoundland and Labrador. The Liberals and PCs both embraced the idea. It is a complex issue. Let's all agree that uh, it's so complex that no known jurisdiction anywhere in the world has established a true universal, uh, universal uh, in, in, uh, guaranteed income benefit. But it's important for us to break through that complication and see what can be done. Basic income experiments have already happened in Canada twice, once in Manitoba in the 1970s and again a couple years ago in Ontario. The incoming Tory government cancelled that pilot program but studies showed it had widespread benefits. Brown is pulling on that data to show how a similar program could work here. People went back to school, people went and found better employment. You know, it gave a lot of people that, that confidence that they needed to, uh, to move forward in their lives. It's all theoretical for now. The committee studying the benefit once it's formed would talk about eligibility, amounts and a possible timeline. Nothing's for certain, including whether it might cost more than it helps. But it raises the question, what would you do with no strings attached cash? These students had an answer. I'd stop my part-time job and um, be able to focus entirely on school, on the things that are actually important to me, whether it be, um, it's, it's really just about not having to do the things that don't progress my future at all. I do work a part-time job right now in the mall and I would probably quit that and put my energy in towards like making music and stuff like that. While some people we asked admitted they'd probably blow the extra money on stuff they didn't need, others said they'd save up for a house or create a rainy day fund. This new resident said eventually they'd buy a farm to help with food security. Until then... I would start paying off my debt. So, free money for all? What could go wrong? Critics say it could eliminate the incentive to work, creating a society of layabouts who eventually bankrupt their own government. Proponents say people getting a basic income buy healthier food, go back to school, and spend more time with family. In the long run, it could even save government money. If you look at the big picture of everything, at the end of the day, it's either going to cost about the same or, or it's going to cost less. The committee doesn't exist yet. It's now up to the reigning Liberals to strike it. Malone Mullen, CBC News, St. John's. Well, the Commissioner for Legislative Standards is recommending MHA Eddie Joyce be suspended from the House of Assembly. Joyce is refusing to make financial disclosures that all members are required to make in order to pinpoint any potential conflict of interest. So why is he refusing to disclose? Well, it's complicated, so let's bring in here now is Peter Cowan to explain. So Peter, what's this all about? Carolyn, Eddie Joyce is really upset about the last report that the Commissioner for Legislative Standards, Bruce Chalk, wrote about him. That was the report that found that he breached the code of conduct by trying to help a friend get a government job. 
and ever since that report came out, he has not been happy with it. And this most recent report found that what Eddie Joyce was doing was he wants some answers from Bruce Chalk, so in return he was holding back some of this financial information. And here's what Bruce Chalk wrote in the report. He said, this does not limit or reduce the obligation of the member to proactively disclose information to my office to ensure compliance with governing legislation. A member has no authority to request information from the commissioner before deciding to comply with provincial law. But I know another member who hasn't filed a part of his claim, but he's not being brought before the House either. I know another member who showed me last week that Bruce Chalk is still waiting for him to get information at the same time. So. So this is not this is not this is just me wanting to know what was discussed with Dwight Ball and his staff. So what he's getting at there is he believes that Dwight Ball was in conversations with Bruce Chalk during the writing of that last report back in 2018, and he wants assurances from Chalk that his financial information wasn't shared with the premier. It is worth pointing out that Dwight Ball is no longer even an MHA, so it would seem very unlikely that the commissioner would have any further discussions with the former premier. And in the report, the commissioner says, given the serious nature of these violations and the unethical behavior exhibited by MHA Joyce, I'm of the opinion that he should be suspended from the House of Assembly until he has fulfilled his statutory obligations. But will that happen? That's now for the House of Assembly to decide. This is never going to have me dismissed from the House. This, if you need the, the House says, why well, give it to him? And he's going to get it. I just want confirmation that my finances were never discussed. It is worth pointing out here that Joyce is still suing some of his former Liberal colleagues. And with an election coming up, is he going to leave politics? Well, not if he can help it. He says he does plan to run in the next election as an independent MHA. Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Peter Cowan for Hearing Now. Well, season tickets may be on sale for Marble Mountain, but as we told you last night, expect a lot of changes this year. The hours will be reduced, one lift will be closed, and the number of people allowed in the lodge will be limited. Here now's Jeremy Eaton spoke with the tourism minister today about what else to expect this season. <laughs> Due to COVID-19, it took a little longer to give the go-ahead for skiing and snowboarding this year, but it is going to look a little different. Marble Mountain will now be closed on Tuesdays and Wednesdays this year, so that's one less day of skiing and snowboarding a week. No booze allowed in the main lodge, but a nearby building will house a burr. Ten-week snow school classes won't be offered. Instead, families can learn to ski in their collective bubbles. And this four-person chairlift, the Black Mariah, it needs a new haul rope cable, so it won't be running. That couldn't be installed prior to the season in 2021, so we're going to look at that as we move forward and, and look at all the, uh, the, the maintenance issues that we may need to be looking at over time with, uh, as the uh, Marble Mountain ages. We've got to make sure we stay on top of some of those assets. The province owns and operates Marble Villa, condos for rent at the base of the mountain. It's decided to keep them closed this season for the sake of other local businesses. The accommodation side at the villa is not going to be operational. Uh, we've decided that we would support our accommodators in the region because of the tough year they've had from an, econo uh, from an economic standpoint and uh, the fact that uh, there was less people here uh, patronizing their establishments. The province says it's working to set up partnerships with the local hotels for ski and stay deals. It will also start its fall winter marketing campaign soon, selling the outdoors to the Atlantic bubble. We're going to encourage people in the Atlantic bubble to come to visit our province and one of the biggest, biggest assets we have in this province on the west coast, which is pretty close to the Atlantic bubble anyway, would be Marble Mountain. The hill is set to open, weather permitting, January 7th, but the mountain itself is still for sale, with Davis saying there has been interest, just no offers yet. Jeremy Eaton, CBC News, St. John's. Well, just down the highway from Marble, Cornerbrook Santa Claus Parade is going ahead, uh, kind of. Only this year, it's going to be the spectators who float along, passing downtown displays. Organizers say it's a safer way to parade during a pandemic. Here now's Colleen Connors has that story. In just over a month, this busy downtown street will transform into a winter wonderland. The parade is not going to pass you. You're going to go by the parade. The Kinsman Club have organized the Santa Claus Parade for almost a decade. Talks of this reverse idea started back in August. 
Well, it's the kids. It's all about the community, getting people together around the festive season and hopefully bring smiles to kids' faces. They didn't want to cancel, so with the help of the city's tourism coordinator, they decided on this reverse idea with the theme of traditional Christmas stories. Local groups are designing storybook covers that will be displayed on large boards along West Street. You'll enter into a storybook land, so this storybook land will have lights on all of our heritage poles, Santa's workshop here in the square, some projectors, a few little odds and ends, and a few little tricks up my sleeve that I won't release. <laughs> The goal is for everyone to stay inside their vehicles, passing by the displays. Well, so people can bring non-perishable food items. We are going to make donations to the food bank. We'll make sure that the letter carriers are collecting letters from the children. At a safe distance, of course. The parade is set for December 12th from 5 to 9 p.m. While this city plans on shutting down one of its main streets for the parade, other cities in this province have a different plan. Mount Pearl is not having a parade at all and it's still not clear what's going to happen in St. John's. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. Well, from Christmas back to Halloween. How's this for a trick or treat? A 12 year old boy in St. John's got more than he bargained for this year while going door to door. Amongst the bars, the chips and all the other candy in his bag, a wedding ring. Now he and his mom are on a mission to return it to its rightful owner. And they spoke with here and now's sees hair. When I first saw it, I just thought it was like something thrown into like a bunch of bags of candy and stuff that people are handing out. And I just thought I'd like give it to one of my little sisters because I thought it was like just like a little plastic ring. In your travels on Saturday night, uh, is there any home in particular that jumps out where this may have happened? Not really. I was just sort of like on the streets around here, but it, yeah, no, it's, not really. Well, we went around to the community mailboxes and put up a few posters. Um, I announced it on my Facebook page and I notified the principal of Vanier School because this is the area where, where all my kids were trick-or-treating. Uh, Nico, being the oldest, went the furthest. Uh, he covered the most territory, but it was all in this neighborhood. So I figured the principal of the school could maybe tweet it out, which she did. And it, it got a, a fair number of comments. <laughs> mm -hmm. Have you had any success? I had one woman contact me who had misplaced her ring, but she sent me a picture of her ring and it was not a match. How do you feel about uh, the notion of putting out a picture uh, of this ring to help find the owner? Well, I thought about putting out a picture, but I figure if anybody's missing a ring, then they know it or they will soon find out. Uh, if I advertise what it actually looked like, how would I know that the person was telling me the truth if they came forward saying they were missing a ring. Um, I just don't think it seems fair to like keep it because someone could be really missing it. And uh, yeah, no, I'd just like to give it back to the owner because yeah, they're, they're probably missing it. Now, the tweet that went out from uh, Vanny Elementary called it a wedding band, but mom says she thinks it could have been an engagement ring. Oh my, well, here's hoping that they find the owner. Uh, well, this is the amount of snow that's on the way. Quick uh, glance at that. We'll talk about the timing and all of that when I come back.
Back to our top story about a man from Brigus being charged with sexual assault and for impersonating a nurse in a retirement home in Bay Roberts. Now, the seriousness of the allegations raised serious questions about screening people who want to work at long-term care centres. I met with a seniors advocate, Dr. Suzanne Brake, this afternoon in Bowering Park. Dr. Brake, very serious allegations about what appears to have happened, uh, charges at the long-term care home in Bay Roberts. How rigorous are, are the background checks on people claiming to be nurses to work in these kinds of places? The regional health authorities are responsible for ensuring that people who are qualified um, go through the recruitment process. So there are a number of different steps that people and, and uh, expectations from people who apply, including um, vulnerable persons check, a vulnerable sector check, I think it's called, um, a criminal record check, and other things about qualifications, um, even things like a flu shot or a, um, a tuberculosis check. But, but in the event that someone's forged documents to make it appear that they're a nurse when they are not, shouldn't that be caught? Well, I would, I would certainly hope so. I would certainly think that I, that would happen. But of course, with this most recent uh, issue, um, I have to question that. You know, we need to do a much better job of ensuring that all of those things um, are checked strenuously. People go to live in a uh, long-term care facility or any kind of an assisted living or a personal care home situation, or they have people come into their own homes in terms of home support workers because they need support and help. That's the whole reason why. And they themselves and their families and friends have a firm belief that these people are vetted, that these people are in fact um, going to provide their loved one with a safe environment. Um, so there is certainly that expectation and I think what we've seen here is clearly that something wrong happened. And I mean, I have no idea about that specific case. I don't know if that was the, the circumstance around it, but certainly families tend to be another level of scrutiny. They do. And like, there's not just, I mean, what happened there, it, you know, it, 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 he's accused of, of sexual assault. That's a very serious assault, but so are other things. So are neglect, so are physical assaults, and they're all, acts of violence. They're acts where, you know, people have power over other people. So we have to always try to ensure, and I as the advocate have to raise awareness about the importance. Well, as a seniors advocate, what are you going to do about what is in the news right now? Uh, gets I will keep monitoring, I'll keep reviewing, I'll keep watching, and I'll keep speaking out. I have, uh, in, when I released my report last year, one thing I recommended was that we have a very strong review of our long-term care system. And when I say system, I mean right from the beginning to the end. So it, uh, that to me is still more important now than ever. We need to do that. And right. we need to put what needs to be in place to protect everybody. Dr. Brake, appreciate your thought and your insight. Thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. Ashley is here now with a look at the weather forecast. It was a pretty blustery night last night. High winds, but this morning I was out for an early morning hike and it was lovely. It was beautiful. It was uh, nice and calm and gray, but yeah. fairly mild. Yeah, those winds finally died down, mm -hmm. uh, what is it, after 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock last mm -hmm. night, but topped out at 112 or 113 kilometers per hour here in St. John's, uh, but temperatures very different if you're walking out the door right now. Let's take a look at the 20, so 24 hours ago, it was 13 degrees warmer in Stephenville, eight in St. John's and uh, 12 degrees warmer in Happy Valley Goose Bay. So we certainly got into some of that colder air. Here's where we're sitting now, four degrees in St. John's, one in Corner Brook, and then a temperature near minus seven for Happy Valley Goose Bay and even colder in Lab City, down to about minus 11 right now. So we do have all that cold air filtering in and it's leading to some snow squalls on the west coast that will generally continue as we head through the overnight tonight. And then we're starting to see some of that cloud cover move in and that's thanks to the next system that's gonna bring lots of snow through parts of uh, the island as we head through the overnight tonight. So we'll time that out for you. Uh, this is uh, where we're gonna see the potential for some snow squalls. The winds are gonna shift a little bit overnight, but you're still gonna see that potential for some snow. 
for the island, we're looking at uh, rain starting in the south, Buren Peninsula as well, and then even up through the Bonavista Peninsula. This will all start as rain. Quickly change over to snow as we head into the early morning hours. It looks like at this point the Avalon is going to stay all rain for the most part. Anything west of the Isthmus is where we're going to see the snow uh, through the overnight tonight. And then into the first half of tomorrow, we'll likely start to see some mixing on the Avalon, maybe with some uh, snow and then ending as flurries as we head into the early morning hours. So this is where our temperatures should be sitting overnight. Avalon staying above zero, hence that rain. Three degrees, uh, again, with the potential to see some mixing into the early morning hours. But overall, those winds will see a shift. Northwesterlies on the uh, west coast. And then in the east, we'll see a shift from southwesterlies to southeasterlies. And they're going to ramp up as well. So 40 to 60 kilometer per hour winds well below zero through uh, central and even into the west coast and then down to about minus 12 for uh, Lab City as you see uh, the potential for some flurries. So this is what it's looking like snowfall wise. The bullseye or the most amount of snow will probably uh, be just west, like I said, of the isthmus. Anywhere from 10 to 20 centimeters is possible. The further west you go, le the less amount of snow, 5 to 10 centimeters, potentially even a trace to 5 in and around Grand Falls, Windsor. And then uh, staying is mainly rain event for the, island, uh, for the Avalon. You're looking at about 20 to as much as 30 millimeters of rain. It's low is going to move through fairly quickly by tomorrow afternoon. We should actually see some clearing skies and again that mixing mid morning uh, ending as flurries more than likely for the Avalon shouldn't accumulate too much and then we're going to see that potential for some snow again on the west coast uh, into the afternoon and then maybe a few flurries up through Labrador as well, but nothing too significant as far as that goes and that will generally continue as we head into the early morning hours on Thursday, eventually going to see some clearing as well. As far as those winds go, they're going to start to ramp up, like I said, into the early morning hours. We do have a wind warning in effect for Bonavista. Could see gusts in those exposed areas upwards of about 100 kilometers per hour uh, tomorrow morning. With these strong winds, uh, anywhere from 60 to 80 kilometers per hour, and some of those uh, heavier snow bands will likely see some blowing snow as well. So that will certainly be an issue. However, it will be mainly through the overnight hours and maybe a little bit into the afternoon tomorrow as well but those winds will ease as we head towards the evening hours, 50 to 60 kilometers per hour. You'll see that onshore flow as well for the west coast, and that's why we're going to see uh, some of that flurry activity. Here's where you'll be sitting temperature-wise tomorrow. Not really recovering too much from what we're going to see, uh, actually dropping in the east. You're looking at uh, uh, temperatures hovering around minus 2 in St. John's as you head towards uh, central into the minus single digits. And then again, note those winds out of the northwest. This will be in the, the first half of the day anyway, from 50 to 70 kilometers per hour. Up through Labrador, plenty of sunshine on tap. Few flurries possible for Lab City though, minus eight. And then coastal flurries as well. Cartwright, you'll be sitting around minus five. So once that area of low pressure moves out, ridge of high pressure will move in. That will keep things pretty calm for Thursday. And then we're going to watch the next weather maker skirt across Labrador, bringing the potential for some showers, uh, even some rain as well for uh, parts of central Labrador. And then this will be a push, another push of warm air. So we are going to see some rain for the island, mostly into Thursday and Friday. And then that will clear out as we head through the day on Saturday. Uh, temperatures looking at uh, single digits on the plus side of the mercury at this point. 2 degrees for St. John's, 5 in Cornerbrook. Uh, this is for Thursday. And then that potential for flurries again up through Labrador, 3 degrees for Happy Valley Goose Bay. And then as we head into Friday, that's when we see that push of warm air. So back into those double digits, even above seasonable. Uh, 11 degrees in St. John's, same thing for Cornerbrook. And then plenty of sunshine for Labrador. However, your temperatures will be below zero uh, through Nain into the afternoon. After uh, Friday and Saturday, then we dip back down into those single digits and with the potential even to see a few flurries uh, for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland Central. Uh, you're looking at a similar drop in temperatures overnight lows back into those minus single digits for the most part up through Labrador as well. Uh, some flurry potentials, but temperatures should stay in above zero until we get into Sunday. And then same thing for you in Lab West. Wanted to share this lovely shot of the sunset in La Cie. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Every, you know, large predator in the North Atlantic is dependent on that fish. So why aren't we considering capelin? This conservationist says they are critical. The broadcast's Jane Aidy brings us that feature report just ahead on Here and Now.
Newfoundland's French shore. See what life was like there almost 35 years ago. Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. Just looking at all those cod before. Well, no cod without Capelin. It's been almost 30 years since the start of the cod moratorium. What might be even more surprising to hear is that the northern cod stock is still in the critical zone, which is the exact same place it was when the moratorium was called. Now, scientists with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans say there's just not enough food for the cod to eat. Now, Capelin is cod's primary food source. Now, a local biologist and conservationist say more attention needs to be paid to this species that is critical to the entire food chain. As the broadcast Jane 80 reports, they are calling for serious consideration of a closure of the commercial Capelin fishery. This very beach, right, would be littered with, with Capelin. If you're looking for a thought-provoking stroll on the beach, you'd do well with this pair. That's conservationist Shane Mahoney to my left and seabird biologist Bill Montevecchi to my right. For decades, they've been trying to focus a lens on the basis of the ocean food chain, Capelin. Our history was founded on cod, but indirectly it was because of Capelin, the lifeblood of the ocean, that we were blessed with such riches. Back in 1997, Shane Mahoney co-wrote a documentary called People of the Sea for National Geographic. Capelin are the most important prey for all marine life here, and they're absolutely critical for one particular hunter the northern codfish. The film included Bill Montevecchi and his work on the Funk Islands studying MERS. What I've noticed recently is that the diets of the birds have shifted from warm water species like mackerel and squid to colder water species like capelin and herring. I've seen that change during the 1990s when we've had anomalously cold water events occurring in the northwest Atlantic. This has serious implications. With a greater demand for capelin and the threat of colder seas, these fish are under more pressure than ever before. It was uh, brought forward in the film, of course, that you know, somehow or other, you have to look at how these two species, capelin and cod, are coupled and figure out what you're going to do about what is absolutely at the bottom of this food chain and make some decisions as a culture, as a society, as a government about how you're going to harvest that renewable resource or whether you will harvest that renewable resource. We've been so focused on cod that we've taken Capelin for granted for far too long. Now more than ever, we're realizing we need to understand the life of this little fish. That was in 1997. Both Mahoney and Montevecchi say more than two decades later, there's still not enough attention being paid to Capelin and the ocean ecosystem and fishery are suffering as a direct result. We stand at a time with the absolute maximum amount of knowledge of that marine ecosystem that we have ever had at any time in human history. And yet we still are not grappling with this fundamental question of Capelin. And I ask the question, why? The most important thing is we call it a forage fish. And that means there's a lot of animals out there that eat it, including cod, whales, seabird, tur turbot, uh, you know, seals. Every, you know, large predator in the North Atlantic is dependent on that fish. So when you look at DFO science and they tell us why, why are the cod not recovering, well, they point out two things. Everybody tends to blame the seals, but the DFO scientists point out two things, one of which is capelin, and the other is the fishery itself. So, I mean, those are, you know, what, and what do we have control over in the ocean? In all of this crazy dynamic, there's only one thing we can control. It's what we do. That's the fishery. When can we get to a point where we intervene and stop fisheries ahead of absolute collapses and do it in a way that allows resurgence and over the long haul maximizes the benefits to the resource, maximizes the benefit to people? That really is the key question. Bill Montevecchi says the science on Capelin being done by the Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans is lacking. DFO scientists are stuck. Look, I work with these people. 
I, I have total respect for DFO science, and I and I wish they could get unstuck. You know, and and enough, you know the reason they're stuck is they here, here in Canada, here in Newfoundland, they cannot do what scientists in Norway and Iceland can do. And that means they don't have the resources, they don't have the capability, they don't have the ship, they don't have the ability to make an assessment of the size of the Capelin stock. So if we don't know that, and we don't, it's probably very small, but we don't know that. All basically the scientists can do is, look, well, it's a good year, it's a bad year, there's relative change that's negative or positive, and those are their options. And on that basis, they cannot, by the way you know, science is done, by the way the legislation is written, they cannot assess Kaplan in a precautionary manner. They cannot set a reference point and say when Kaplan gets to, this is what they can do in Iceland. This is what they can do in Norway. When Kaplan gets to this level, we shut it down. And then when it comes back, we'll open the fishery if we want to have it. And every time they've done that in Norway and Iceland, every time they've done that, the cod have come back. So it's, it's a no brainer. We just don't have the opportunity to do it. And you know, in the defense is, oh, it's so small. It's just a small fishery. Well, the fact of the matter is it's a fishery that's fishing the next generation. It's an egg targeted fishery. Th those by their definition uh, are you know, self-destructing. In the end, we have a system that has limits and that system can only bring a certain level of benefit to humanity, to cultures and societies and incomes and livelihoods and communities. And we cannot, we cannot expand it beyond there. So when we look at circumstances where an absolute primary basis of the food chain, not just for cod, but for many, many, many species in the ocean, is being harvested at a time when we know numbers are relatively low. We know numbers are even lower than the peak numbers post the major decline of Capelin in 2014. They've already declined. When we know that there are systemic problems in the ocean with phytoplankton and zooplankton production and so on and so forth, we know there are delayed spawning events taking place for our capelin, so there's a systemic problem out there somewhere, then it seems to me that the cautionary approach is to say, let's retract, let's move back from the harvest of this species with one important proviso. We have to decide that this is an important enough problem that we will deal with it, and then governments, have to find the resources to invest in this. If we were to foreclose that fishery, then the Department of Fisheries and Oceans has to have the wherewithal to be able to study what the impact of that closure would be on people and on the marine ecosystem and on the response by other foraging species such as cod. But there's no point starting something like this and running it for two years. We already know we have so much variability in spawning season dates, food systems in the sea for Capelin and otherwise. There, there's absolutely no way for me to imagine doing something like this in less than a decade and maybe longer. Both Mahoney and Montevecchi feel fishermen currently involved in the commercial Capelin fishery should be compensated for their licenses so they can move away from the harvest. What they also call for is public pressure on the provincial and federal governments. And the most important thing from my perspective is information and to put it out there for people to consider it, talk about it and think about it and uh, we have options. But otherwise, if we just ignore it, well, we're, you know, we're going down the wrong road here. I say there are some people that see it as a major problem. Some people do not see it as a major problem. The real question, Jane, the real question here is not really whether ultimately DFO sees it as a problem. The real question is whether the people of Newfoundland and Labrador see it as a problem. And if we see it as a problem of sufficient scale, we need to tell our new government that we do, and our new government, of course, will lobby the people who garnered control of our fisheries in 1949 to get them to do something about supporting DFO to pursue these questions and do this research. Mahoney says his passion for the potential of the local fishery won't waver, but he is growing tired of governments that don't fully support and protect the future of a renewable resource. If you look back at our history, we've come from Premier Smallwood all the way on up through the long line of premiers that we've had to our new premier of today. Please tell me the premier, the government, that really placed the Newfoundland fishery as an absolute priority. I can give you lots of governments that put mega projects, 
whether it's oil or uh, you know, mining or hydroelectric development or whatever it might be as a major focus and a priority. But please tell me, ask your listeners, what government placed the Newfoundland fishery as an absolute priority in its mandate? Name me the premier that ever got involved in the Newfoundland fishery. Montevecchi and Mahoney say it's time for a decades-long debate over a controversial fishery to conclude. The intent of this documentary more than two decades ago is still on their minds. A healthier ecosystem and a viable industry. The same determination that saw us make a life in this harsh land will, if we are careful, bring back our dream. An ocean filled with fish. Jane Aidy, CBC News, St. John's. So let's play a speed game. I'll say a name and you say the first word that pops into your mind. Okay. Joe Biden. Next president of the United States of America. Donald Trump. Absolutely burned on the worst president in the U.S. history. Okay, some very strong feelings about this. You are not the only one. Coming up on Here and Now, we'll speak with this passionate U.S. political watcher about tonight's election.
Well, it's election day in the United States, but for those of us north of the border, this is really just a spectator sport, but that doesn't mean a lot of people aren't emotionally invested in the outcome of this election. Joining me now is one such person, George Osmond, uh, here in Mount Pearl. Uh, you decided to uh, create your own campaign sign here. Can you tell me why you decided to do that? Uh I'm always big on U.S. politics, and, and Joe Biden is, 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 is the only answer right now, what I think, is a clear election of, of right and wrong, of good and evil, and I just wanted to show my support to my community here of, of what I think is good and right. And I had my children help me with the sign. Uh, we're planning on having a little celebration here today as we watch the election results. Got a pile of food, it's going to be a little party here. I got a few friends invited over and some family to come help us watch what I think is going to be a fabulous night for the Democratic Party in the United States. And like I said, this is a spectator sport for us. We can't vote. We, we're pretty helpless in this whole situation. But what do you think is at stake for our country in this election? Well, we're dependent on the United States a lot, and I was looking at an overlay of the map just of the coronavirus, and there was only a, a they had it outlaid in red for hot spots. Uh, we had a hot spot in Canada at, in Vancouver. I think there was another one in Toronto and maybe Montreal, Ontario. But the whole of the United States was just shaded red. Shaded, shaded red is just too much on the line in this election for the United States not to make the right choice tonight. I think they have to make the right choice, and I think there's enough good Americans that are going to make the right choice. It's going to be, I'm calling it, a landslide for Joe Biden. I even think Texas is going to go blue for the first time since 1976 when, yes, the peanut farmer, Jimmy Carter, was president. All right, George Osmond, thank you so much for uh, speaking me with me and uh, giving me your thoughts on all this. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Let's go, Joe! The, uh, the Dallas Cowboys blue star there, and his head says it all, too. Now, we're going to find out soon enough. It's been a long and bitter campaign between rivals Donald Trump and Joe Biden. And as you just heard, it is now up to the American voters to find a future for themselves. But despite a record turnout, the path to victory tonight may not be straight or easy. Rafi Bujikanyan reports. One last push of campaigning on the big day. Joe Biden subdued after a late night with a celebrity endorsement. Right now it's time for action. Visiting his childhood home in Pennsylvania. <laughs> While Donald Trump turned up on Fox and Friends to boast. We think we're winning Texas very big. We think we're winning Florida very big. But at this point, it's all in the hands of voters and the Electoral College. And it comes down to a handful of battleground states, such as Florida. This is my first time voting, actually, so I'm actually really excited. The state holds 29 of those all-important Electoral College votes, all snatched up by Trump four years ago. The first lady there today making the case to keep the Sunshine State red. It's election day, so I wanted to come here to vote. But besides campaigning and stump speeches, there are concerns about violence. Cities boarding up the White House, too. The FBI is involved, investigating this incident of Trump supporters running a Biden campaign bus off the road last week in Texas. It's all trickled down to worries even in states that aren't along the voter battleground. It just seems like there's so uh, much hate in the country right now. With COVID, a lot of people were afraid to come in, so I guess the courts just said, you know, you have to do it, you have to let these votes be counted. Close to 100 million Americans have already cast their ballots. Because of the pandemic, several states are allowed to count mail-in ballots for several days after polls officially close. And there is another reason the country could stay in suspense beyond tonight. Republicans have already challenged mail-in ballots in several jurisdictions in court. And the president has said that's very well where he may return if he doesn't like the results tonight. Rafi Bujikanian, CBC News, Garrisonville, Virginia.
Well, back in this country, the Prime Minister has an urgent warning for Canadians today. Justin Trudeau says a second wave of COVID-19 is coming on hard and the opportunity to turn it around is closing fast. The second wave of COVID-19 in places like the UK, Belgium and France is a wake-up call that Canadians cannot afford to ignore. Right now, this virus is being given the chance to spread. It's being given the opportunity to grow. I know that's hard to hear, but the numbers are showing us that our window to turn this around is closing fast. We have to work together right now. Trudeau says Canadians everywhere have to cut their in-person contacts. And then there are masks. Dr. Teresa Tam says people are, are, are inside more now due to the colder temperatures. So it's important that non-medical masks have three layers. The degree of protection that non-medical masks provides varies with the construction, the number of layers, materials used, and most importantly, the fit of the mask. To improve the level of protection that can be provided by non-medical masks or face coverings, we are recommending that you consider a three-layer non-medical mask, which includes a middle filter layer. And to find out more about how to make a three-layer mask, you can go online to canada.ca slash coronavirus.
And so before we finish up tonight, uh, let's recap some of that uh, stormy weather on the way. Yeah, we'll just go through that one more time. Let's take a look at the amounts. It's looking like the most will be west of the isthmus. We're looking at anywhere from 10 to 20 centimeters of snow. The further west you go, significantly less. Uh, and then this should be a mainly rain event for the Avalon. We're looking at about 20 to 30 millimeters of rain. Just to time that out, rain will start this evening and then continue to spread further east, eventually change uh, north rather, eventually change over to uh, snow for the Bonavista and Buren Peninsulas. And then this should just be all snow through uh, central. And then as we head into tomorrow afternoon, things should taper to flurries and clearing. So not too bad. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for us. Good night, everyone. Good night.